on this episode of Still Loading. Look, plumber's crack. <laughs> I mean, the plumber's back. <laughs> Hey guys, we're back. Still Loading is back. And for our first episode, Justin is still out this weekend. He is at Otakon doing whatever he does at Otakon, animating it up and whatnot. Uh, so I have my good old buddy Tristan here. Hello. Uh, Tristan and I are going to be discussing today the Ratchet and Clank series. We are both gigantic Ratchet and Clank fans. Wouldn't you say so? Uh, yes, yes I would. When, would, when did you first get hooked on the series? Oh, gosh. Whenever the second one came out, I think, is when I, I picked up a PS2 specifically to play the Ratchet & Clank series. I remember that. I also remember freaking... I saw you playing it, and I got really jealous, so I didn't. Ha- I couldn't order anything that through my house, so I had you order the game for me, and I brought the money to uh, you. Yeah, yeah, that totally happened. <laughs> <laughs> we, I used to also get you to buy games for me on Steam before I had a credit card and pay right. you cash yeah. for the. I was a lazy. Kid. Blast from the past, <laughs> there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we we've been playing Ratchet and Clank for a while now, a long while. I remember I got the PS2. This was back when Blockbuster was still around. Because mm-hmm. you asked me to rent. Ratchet and Clank one because you thought it looked cool from Blockbuster. Hey man, those commercials, right? <laughs> like, I don't remember much of the commercials. I just remember you playing. I'm like, oh, I tried it before. It was alright. It ultimately was you that got me rehooked onto the series. Same thing with kind of like Uncharted. Like I beat one and two. I'm like, oh, they were fun. And then that's another episode we could do another day. Um, yeah, I gotta wait for uh, the fourth one to come out. And we'll yeah, like... or like right before the fourth one, kind of have a retrospective on it because like a... it. Is it getting released this year? Uh, no, early to mid-2016, I believe. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. But in any case, we will also be touching on uh, the movie that Ratchet & Clank is coming out, or the Ratchet & Clank movie that's coming out uh, supposedly sometime next year, like early 2016. Yeah, it's uh, April or March, I think. Something like that. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, but I figured we'd start out with um, just like the first, like just kind of first talk about the first game, I guess, and then just kind of talk about games after that throughout the series. So the first one kind of set the groundwork for a lot of the humor, a lot of the gameplay style, the mechanics and everything. Nothing was really polished until the second one, which I think we're going to focus a lot on going command. Well, we're not going to go command. I hate well, these anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, originally, uh, Into the Nexus was supposed to be called Into the Nethers. Oh, well, that was from that, uh, what is it? Did you see the, did you know gaming video for Ratchet & Clank? Uh, I don't believe I have. We'll have to watch it later. Yes. If, I mean, we're not going to, hopefully we're not taking a lot of facts from there, but that's an interesting video. Like, t- um, the All for One Ratchet & Clank game was going to be called uh, Foursome, <laughs> or like, uh, I forget, there's a whole bunch of others. Like, oh, they, they would have done so much better if they there called is, it Foursome. There's a whole bunch of different names that they wanted to go with, but they were afraid that uh, like that by the like really like harsh and well, harsh, but very strong innuendos would have dissuaded parents from buying it for their kids. Understandably, I guess. Yeah, when I, you have like, I guess, I guess. Oh, I don't remember all the names, but definitely check out that video. There's lots of cool little tidbits on it. Um, but the first one was awesome because it had like all the weapons were really fun. That's when you like I forget like half of them. That's the first weapons were the bomb glove. Mm-hmm. Was it a, a lance? No, the lancer came after. No, it was the it was, it was called the shooter. I think it was just called the blaster. The blaster. That was yeah. it. that. That didn't come. So you had the bomb glove, and what was the other one? Was it a flamethrower? Uh, yeah, I think you got the pyrocitor at the second planet. Okay, you're better with the names than I am. I just remember the bomb glove. That yeah, was about it. Yeah, yeah, bomb glove, pyrocitor. Or pyrocider, however you want to say it. But uh, like, yeah. it was pretty rough around the edges because uh, remember you couldn't really. Like, the game didn't pause when you were selecting weapons, Mm -hmm. so you had to really know what you were doing on the fly. 
Yeah, you had to had to have your quick select menu like memorized, memorized, and you know you do like a a dodge jump, and while you're still mid air, kind of switch out. That was ter- especially during the final boss. Mm-hmm. The easiest way to beat that final boss is to save up for the rhino. <laughs> it's not even a challenge. <laughs> you just kind of like click or. Did I tell you how I got the rhino on the when I did the remaster one? Was that the uh, the glitch in the hoverboard? Yeah, you, yeah, can, yeah. you can glitch through the hoverboard, and I just taped down the circle, the fire button on mm-hmm. the, the taunter. The taunter was another weapon; it would just taunt enemies over. It had had a, it had didn't have ammo because it was just basically something that would like honk horns and stuff like that. So it would break boxes, though. So you would stand on the hoverboard, you would glitch your way into the hoverboard map, and just kind of press circle down, and the boxes above would just constantly like break and you because they respawn respawn naturally because it's on the hoverboard map so you would end up getting tons and tons of bolts just by holding the circle button now i think it took like two hours or something i just held it down and let it go yeah there's there's one achievement in there to get like an absurd amount of bolts and i think i'm pretty sure you can only do the glitch once yeah so i was gonna try and wait until i had gotten like some other stuff legit and then just leave it on for like two days to get that last achievement Oh, that would have been nuts. I would have taken so long. I know. It's like how, especially in that one, because bolts are like real hard to come by. And they're not near, and they're harder to see, so you always miss them. Because in all the future ones, they had glow, it would, they would glow, mm. you know. But the first one, they didn't have. There was no glowing. It was just it kind of blended in with the background a lot. Yeah. Um, I also remember like that's where you first meet Captain Quark, who's like hands down the best villain slash ally in any game i've ever played i he's just ridiculous yeah no no other ones come to mind right now well i'm i shouldn't say the best but he's my personal favorite i think it's just he's he's so hilariously stupid mm-hmm. and just over the top like when we get to the ps3 games like tools of destruction i love how like he sends you ratchet on missions mm. and he always like sends you on these horrible missions where he's like and i will you know bravely pilot you over the shark infested waters while you jump down i forget what it was mm-hmm. and all his like crayon drawings of, like, what you're <laughs> gonna like, do. this is my master plan so uh agent codename dead meat and <laughs> we'll um we actually have all the games out here in front of us so if you hear some uh opening and closing of cases do not be alone. There was... Was it this one? Uh, one of them has a hilarious... It must be this one. The last one I opened. Yeah, here. For all for one, you've got the Copernicus Quark's awesomely epic 3D adventure through time and space. With his little... <laughs> yeah, his little crayon drawings. I didn't even notice that. And you can... Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you can, can actually flip, flip it, it over. That's genius. It's got some of like, the, the uh, concept art on the back there, too. Right here. That's yeah, pretty yeah. cool. I had no idea that even existed. Yeah, nice little uh, out of game Easter egg for you. I like how it even has like it's for three and a half players. They cut off half a person on that instead of four. Cause mm. um, but anyway, so the first game was really fun. Uh, it had some unique, like it was unique for a platformer for the when it came for the time when it came out because the only other r- real 3D platform that was big on the PS2 was Jack and Daxter, which was definitely big in its own right like everyone knows jack and daxter Mm -hmm. but uh i mean naughty naughty dog did that insomniac does the ration and client games and their own their only other games before that were spyro which were also pretty good 3d platformers Mm -hmm. um but ratchet and clank was just so unique because it was a platform but it was also a shoot 'em up but also a shooter at the same time not just like because i guess there's a fine line difference between a shoot 'em up and a shooter but like they kind of blended platforming shoot 'em ups and shooters all in one. Yeah, I think the first one is where that's the most murky. Um, just Definitely. because you, you couldn't strafe, which was like a <sighs> that was a big deal for me, which they fixed in in the next couple games. And which since we might as well been... just go right into the second game, Going Commando. Which, by the way, if we say weird things, it's because all the games have innuendos, just about, with the exception of like the later ones. Like, just to run off a couple, the second game's called Go- Ratchet & Clank Going Commando. This, the third game's called Ratchet & Clank Up Your Arsenal. After that, there's a PSP game called Size Matters. There is uh, Tools of Destruction, which that's a little... You know, you can use your imagination with that. Uh, there's cr- a Crack in Time, which I don't know, maybe Plumber's Crack or Plumber's Back, whatever you want to mm-hmm. call it. But, uh, so they all have innuendos, for those who don't know. 
But the second one just refined so much on the first. Yeah, they really... They took even, like, the weapons. If you compare the Devastator, which is, like, the rocket launcher from the first game, to... Wasn't the tube rocket or something? No. Yeah, I... Something like that. It, I know it had multiple tubes as you upgraded it. You know what? I can grab my phone quick and then we can... The beauty of technology. Mm-hmm. And but we can just look up weapons on here. But yeah, the whatever the rocket launcher was from, um, going commando, it actually had a second form, where it started off basically like the Devastator, just a single tube rocket launcher. And once you upgraded it, it had four tubes that you could actually charge up and fire all four at once. Well, this game just, uh, it also um, came up with the idea of actually upgrading your weapons. Like, the more you use it, you could level up your weapons. What, three? No, it was only once. Yeah, I think it was just... It was the later games that uh, let you level it up more than once. Yeah. Um, up your arsenal, which is, I guess, aptly named, considering how many times you can level up your weapon. I think it's like a total of six. Something like, yeah, like six the, or the eight. First th- you can level it up th- th- three times on your first playthrough, and then another three times on your second playthrough. Mm-hmm. Something like that. This is not help. That was not the right thing to look at. Um, but no, Going Commando was an amazing game. It's still considered widely to be the best game in the series. Up Your Arsenal technically has higher review scores, but a lot of people point to uh, Going Commando because it was the first game. Pretty much every game you play after Going Commando, it they, they kind of... Excuse me. They... It models it after going... Every game after going Commando models it after going Commando. The the whole gameplay style, the leveling up of your weapons, the how, how the spaceship even works, like where you can kind of customize it a little bit. Um, the, like, you know, the box breaker first appears in going Commando. The bolt grabber first appears in going Commando. Was there a map matic in the first game? I don't think so. Uh, that is there a might have been. Question. I'm not sure. But they also kind of came up with ideas of like... Uh, funny, funny names for new weapons and whatnot. So you have like you know, uh, they have it starts out with the Blitz Cannon, which was that was like the shotgun. That was a cool one. Mm-hmm. That was the first one. They have the Sheepinator, so you can turn everyone into sheeps. You know, and when you upgrade it, you get the Black Sheepinator, so they explode afterwards. As much as I enjoyed the Morpho Ray from the original, specifically because of the uh, the commercials, which I distinctly remember mm-hmm. where they had the the two live action guys playing with it and he turns the other guy into a chicken or something yeah uh, i really did like the sheepinator i like all the i mean they definitely modified it later on because in what is it in um in uh full frontal assault i think you get the the christmas sizer or whatever the winterizer where right, you yeah, turn yeah. everything into snowmen and then you hear like you hear like jingle bells in the background, and all the guys where their weapons are is just candy canes instead. So like the little crabs are just like little tiny people with giant candy canes in their tiny hands that look like claws. Yeah, that was uh, into the Nexus. Into the Nexus had that. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, but anyway, going commando. Uh, the storyline was really unique because it took place in a different, not really unique, but it was it was a lot better than the first one. Mm-hmm. Um, it took place in a different galaxy. Um, there was actually there was an actual like somewhat of a plot where like you know there's a plot twist in it as opposed to just a straightforward thing. Mm-hmm. Like I mean, I guess the first one kind of did because Quark starts out on your side, quote unquote, but you can tell he's an ass right from the get go. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like it doesn't surprise you at all. I remember playing through Going Commando and finding out, spoilers for those who haven't played it, that um, the guy who hires you to like save his galaxy turns out to be Captain Quark in disguise who just was just trying to use you to basically take over that galaxy. Yeah, I forget how it, it was all... the protopet. Yeah, yeah. Um... Because a scientist who you thought was the bad guy stole the protopet, and Quark hires you to get the protopet back, and then... Use, basically uses you to destroy the galaxy, which you end up... And, like, he can't control the protopet because that turns into the giant one, which I, he... You don't even fight Quark as the final boss. You have to defeat the giant protopet. Mm-hmm. Which, again, if you have the Rhino 2, just take <laughs> about a 15-second boss fight. <laughs> it's yeah. really short. I remember I was trying to play it through one time. I was getting really frustrated. I'm like, screw this. I'm going to get the Rhino. I just saved up for the Rhino. It didn't take as long as I thought. Mm-hmm. But in that game also you have, because it was like a million bolts for the Rhino, which 
takes a long amount of time, but they also, it was the first time they had arenas. Remember? Right. Uh, yep. you, mm-hmm. you had all the different arena challenges, and you had, like, the impossible challenge. Yep. All the uh, gladiator deals. Those are all. There was two gladiator cool. arenas mm-hmm. in that one. So, this was the first time they had arena fights in that, um, which is where, which I still haven't beat in Deadlocked. That's all Deadlocked was. You know, Deadlocked is a great game. I, yeah. It actually has co-op. So we could we could try to play that sometime. We should definitely do that because I still have to play. That's one of the few games I have not beaten in the series. Now that I think about it, mm-hmm. the only ones I have yet to beat are uh, Going Mobile, which is the phone game from like 2004, which I can't find. I mean, I can find it online, but I don't like. It's not you can't play it online. You can the download sites I have found. I don't even know if I'm actually downloading the game because I can't get it to work on anything. Mm-hmm. So for all I know, that could be a virus, but yeah, it's more sketchy than it's worth. Yeah, it's so if anyone out there is listening and can tell me how to play that game, I'd really just want to see. I've seen screenshots of what it looks like. It looks like a side-scrolling shoot 'em up or a shooter, so it looks awesome. But I just it's hard to find. Anyway, so any other wor- final thoughts on Going Commander before we move on to Up Your Arsenal? Well, I'm I'm looking at the uh, the weapon list here. Mm-hmm. And it's you know they have a lot of them that are the same, where you've got uh, you have a bomb glove called the exact same thing. Um, you do get a gravity bomb. Oh, that's the upgraded bomb glove, right? Uh, it's it's actually a completely separate. separate oh weapon. no, because you could get all the old weapons from the first game if yes. you had a save file, yes, or you you're could right. pay out the ass for it if you didn't have an original save file. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you got your mini rocket tube, uh, lava gun, lancer instead of the blaster. Lava gun was cool. Cause that, that was really fun. Because even after you would fire it, there was still residue that would come out, mm-hmm. so you could always hit a couple extra guys instead of wasting your ammo. In Going Commando, it upgraded to the meteor gun. Which was not nearly as good. Right. But in later games, it gets turned into the liquid nitrogen gun. Which was pretty awesome. Right? Which was quite awesome. Also, the puzzle solving was, I always like in this series, like, because they always give you plenty of gadgets. Uh, the grind boots isn't really much of a puzzle, but it's a really fun platforming section. Mm-hmm. I always enjoy doing grind boot sections. Man, I can remember in the first one, where you first have to get the grind boots on, uh, whatever it was, like, Planet Battalia or something. I'm amazed you remember any of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, named because of the battle that was going on. Yeah. Um, I remember it being so hard when we were, like, what, early teenagers playing I these? don't even know. We were, like, 12 or 13. Yeah. Um, going back and playing them in the HD collection, like, two years ago, I have no idea why that was so hard. Well, you didn't have <laughs> as good... Your Your motor skills are better now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of cool weapons in uh, Going Commando. Just the game in general just was awesome. They also didn't have hover bike races too. Yeah, it yes, did. It did. Mm-hmm. Had hover bike races. I mean, the first game had the, the the hoverboard races, which I still hate those. I don't like hover. I don't like the races that much. They're really frustrating in general. Yeah, yeah. In the first one, in particular, it was. That was rough. Um, it gets a lot more fun in the second and third. Well, when you I the ju- bikes. well. I just recently beat Size Matters for the first time on the PSP, and the races in that game are really difficult. Okay. I did not enjoy those at all either. Mm. But I like, I do like, and oh well, to go further into it, also with up, uh, Going Commando, that's like the first game kind of set the set its tone a little bit, but the second one's really where they locked in their humor, mm-hmm. definitely. Because the second and third one, Upper Arsenal, these two just they locked in their humor to a science practically. You know Ratchet and Clank humor from those two games. Man, I can still remember most of the lyrics to the... Uh, Britney Gears? Britney Gears music video. <laughs> it's yeah. not a bad song. It's, it's really not. Like yeah. uh, <laughs> For those who don't know, in the third game, they uh, you find out Clank... Like, Ratchet and Clank basically become so famous that Clank, like, within the galaxy for saving it whatnot, that Clank gets his own TV show called Secret Agent Clank, which... And there's a game based off which I have not beaten yet. I own it, but have not had a chance to beat it yet. Uh, and he's become so famous. There's a thing called Secret Agent Clank. Well, one of the biggest pop stars in the galaxy, Brit- uh, Courtney, Courtney Gears, Gears not right. Brittany Gears. Courtney Gears had. She's a robot who apparently falls in love with Clank, 
Uh, but she had like she hates humans, and her whole pop song's all about killing humans. Mm-hmm. But it's so happy sounding. Yeah, I think she was working with Doctor Nefarious to uh, turn all of the air quotes squishies or <laughs> any kind of organic matter into robots. And I love how Doctor Nefarious, whenever he like short circuits a lot, you hear that bizarre soap opera on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I forget what. I forget what some there's some really good quotes. Maybe if I can find them I'll put them in, but I like put them in intermittent the in between like transitions here, I was, but I was from that family of gypsy ninjas. <laughs> gypsy ninja robots, something like that. I know. My parents were murdered by that family of gypsy ninja robots or something. It was amazing. But um it was like Going Commando had its first little bits of humor. Like I still remember in the first race you find out like uh like there's a bunch the first race is a bunch of biker dudes and they're talking about how they like to dress up nice and have tea parties and things like that so as it still it still sticks with me um but i can't is there anything else you wanted to go on with going commando i mean i um I, we keep going back to it it's such a good game but i was just thinking i love even though i hated it as a kid the the desert and the ice planet with the yetis. Mm-hmm. The desert with just the crabs, or was it just a bunch? Of... They had some kind of weird lobster floating monsters, lobster things. Yeah, and then they had the giant like sand. No, no, they were like floating eyeballs. Right. Like, yeah, yeah the like eye laser guys. Right. And the, in the ice planet, it was the giant dragons under the ice. You remember what I'm talking oh, about? Oh yeah, they're like and hydras. Then, yeah, and yeah. then the big yetis. Those yetis are still hard to kill. Mm-hmm. They are outrageously difficult to kill. I hated those things, especially when you accidentally like aggro eight of them, and you're just like, "Oh my god!" And they chase you forever. Mm-hmm. They have they you can't get out of their range because they their their legs are so long. Or so, I don't know whatever. Yeah. It just it's ridiculous. That was really cool. They did that in other games too, because like in Up Your Arsenal, you had the whole sewer crystal thing. Yeah. Um... The sewer crystal thing was okay. Um, I liked how they kind of expanded on it, depending on what gadgets you had. Like, once you got your mag boots, you could go up to, like, different levels. And Yeah. But uh, overall, I think I liked the desert and the, the ice Oh, I more. did too. Yeah. I mean, I don't like the yetis that much, but mm-hmm. they were interesting at least. Um, but, all right, so I guess let's move on to Up Your Arsenal. Um, okay. So, Up Your Arsenal was the third installment in the series, and it was a damn good one. Uh, that was, remember the Ranger missions? I do. That The first thing I remember about that game is, like, you, Ratchet is tasked with, like, saving the universe, you know, again. I forget, I forget exactly, oh, um, Dr. Nefarious, who's, like, he's just, that's his first game he's introduced, and he's a mm-hmm. major reoccurring villain in the series. I feel like this is, like, a James Bond series, you know? Yeah. Major reoccurring villains, bizarre gadgets corny senses of humor this is basically the james bond of old school james bond of video games mm-hmm. but and in a good way that's not even talking about secret agent clank which yeah. is a blatant ripoff of, of james, james bond. bond um but uh i just remember like dr nefarious is up to go- no good the only person who's ever stopped nefarious was captain quark but no one's seen captain quark since you beat him in the second game and you find him on a planet, and he thinks he's a monkey. It's one of nature's mysteries. <laughs> that, and that's where the, like, some of the funny docu, like docudrama yeah, stuff yeah. they made would come in. Oh, God, this game is so good. But no, so you have to... You go to a planet to, like... Um, I forget why what planet why you go to the planet, but basically you pair a drop in with a bunch of other soldiers, and you have and they had a bunch of missions where like it was like a side quest thing that you could do after you beat the main part of it, but like they had a bunch of extra missions where it was just you running around on a battlefield, almost kind of like like battlefield nineteen forty two style but like mm-hmm. not necessarily with certain numbers of like enemies on each side you had you had to complete objectives, but it was like open it was open world for that little bit. Yeah, it was a little... I remember when I first played it, I thought it was the best thing ever. It's kind of annoying now. Yeah, looking back on it, I feel like the series got a little convoluted in the third installment, where it didn't really know if it wanted to be like Going Commando, which it still was. But with these little extra things, it felt like it was trying to be a Battlefield game. Yeah. Um, That being said, it was still really fun going around with little hover tanks and blowing stuff up and yeah. shooting enemies yeah. those missions were tough though a lot of them were yeah i 
I remember I had to force myself when I was replaying the HD collection to do it, and it was still just not fun as as much, not as much fun as I remember it being. Mm -hmm. Um, What else? I mean, I mean, you had the. I think I actually really liked the storyline of Up Your Arsenal a lot, just because it was just fun. Doctor Nefarious is a great villain. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of Nefarious. He's such a goofy villain. I just. He's pro- he's probably the most memorable villain. Like Quark shows up, but he doesn't really become a he's never really a villain again after the second game. He's always just kind of like the bumbling idiot. Yeah, cuz what? The first one he's in league with the villain. Mm-hmm. And the second one he is the villain. And from then on he's just kind of like the goofy guy who wants to be the hero but is kind of a wuss and yeah. nobody knows what his deal is. But I mean, he kind of was the villain, if you think about it, in Full Frontal Assault, because, I mean, okay, he wasn't really the villain, but he was, like, the, you find out the villain, there spoilers for those who haven't played it, uh, it's a Captain Quark fan, an old Captain Quark fan who hates him, so he created the enemy, so he kind of was the bad guy, but you don't actually fight him. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a really, that's stretchy. Yeah, it's a little really, bit of a stretch. That's not but... a, that's a lot of a stretch. <laughs> That's like yoga right there. Mm. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a stretchy, big stretch. Yes. But um, no, so Up Your Arsenal was just cool because that's when they uh, added like all the bonus, uh, like you could upgrade your weapon three times and then the New Game Plus there was even more. Couldn't you upgrade? There was a lot more armor upgrades in this one. So for the weapons, again, looking at it online here, um, each one could be upgraded five times okay. in, the, in the initial game. And then after that, you could pay to upgrade it to a Mega Weapon, and then it would upgrade as you used it to Giga and then Omega Weapons. So So it was was about eight times. That's nuts. Mm -hmm. And that's coming from the original two, and then I think four in New Game Plus for Going Commando. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge step. That's Mm -hmm. As opposed to only four, you're getting eight. They doubled it, basically. It really wasn't up your arsenal type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, we didn't ever really touch on any of these yet, but like I loved all the gadgets that you would. Ha- I, I remember I tried bringing it up earlier, but the the gadgets, not just the grind boots, but the ones you know, like what was the infiltrator was one. I forget which game that was from. There is the trespasser. The trespasser, from the first game. Okay, and that had to do with. God, I forget how that one worked. But it was each, like lasers that you. But had each to of line those up. gadgets was like a little puzzle mini game, mm-hmm. which was really fun. And then you would have the gadgets that kind of affect the environment, like. The one was the thermo therm, therm it's in the second or third game. The I Terminator. The Terminator, where you could like thaw and freeze water. Uh, um, the tractor beam. That was another, another one. one. That was from the second one as well. Yeah, the dynamo or dynamo, if you will. That was like your all-purpose, like everything. Yeah, you know? I think they eventually mushed that one into the swing shot. Yeah, and well, they they basically they streamlined the swing shot through the dynamo in Going Commando, mm-hmm. and then the swing shot just came back. And I remember when you first get that in the first game, the swing shot was awesome. I just I just love the platforming in Ratchet and Clank. Like yeah, it's a fun yeah. shoot 'em up, but it's also fun just to like use the swing shot and just swing from one thing to the other. Yeah, I feel like the first Ratchet and Clank game is kind of reminiscent, not necessarily reminiscent, but. uh kind of works the same way as the original Jack and Daxter, where it's kind of like a more innocent time, when yeah. things are more about jumping and kind of having fun, and, you know, the series tends to get a little bit more serious after that, with, as far as, like, the shooting goes. Well, like, Jack and Daxter went way serious. Yeah. Ratchet yeah. and Clank still kind of kept a silly, happy-go-lucky kind of feel. Mm-hmm. Um, one second, sorry, keep... Uh, yeah, but we got other stuff, like... Let's see. The Levitator. The glider's always good. What? Which one is the Levitator from? Uh, that's from the second one. Really? Maybe purchased from a shady salesman. <laughs> Slim Cognito? Oh, Nito? okay, so that's like a jetpack. Oh, um, oh, okay, I remember that. Which... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I also get, like... So we're jumping all over the place. It's hard to keep track. There's a lot of weapons in these games. Yeah. Um. Right now, we are still kind of on up your arsenal, but we're going to kind of jump around a lot uh but then the what was it they had the glider from the second one you remember mm-hmm. that that was that wasn't the first time you get the glider was one of the most difficult things to navigate that canyon we remember how long we tried oh, when yeah, we were a kid? yeah the canyon 
Um, I mean, it's still difficult even as an adult. It gets even more difficult later on in the game when you go to... I forget what planet it is, but basically you fight your way through the whole level and then you have to glide your way back. And that was like a machine factory where they had like all sorts of gears and stuff you had to fly through. and uh-huh. Yeah, it was intense. Excuse me. Um... But I don't, I mean, I don't have too much more to say about Up Your Arsenal because I don't remember it too much. It's not, the last game I played was um, Size Matters. Mm -hmm. Um, One more gadget that I think is worth mentioning from Up Your Arsenal was the Refractor. Yeah, it was like the little shield ball and you would have to, you could like aim, like if light hit it like a laser, you could deflect it and kill enemies with it. You could re-aim the laser, um, kill enemies with it, and then that was a big part of the puzzles was re-aiming that laser. And it was also a skill point to kill a certain number of enemies. Yes. Skill points, that's something we haven't mentioned at all yet. Every game had them. Yeah, it was kind of the the old school achievements or trophies um, before... I don't know. I still thought they mattered, but you didn't get that score to kind of brag about it. Well, no, they like. Well, that's because we didn't know about like a, if you want to think of it like a gamer score or anything like that back then. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, yeah, now we have it and we're used to it, but um, back then you didn't have that. So, like, I remember when I would come over to your house and we would play Ratchet and Clank. I would look at all how many skill points you have. I'm like, man, I'm jealous because I don't have that many. I'd go home and try to get them. Mm-hmm. And I remember we would like trade off and be like, oh, I just found this one. And you would tell me about the one you found. And then we'd try to get it and whatnot. Yeah. And this was in like the yeah, it's still kind of early ages of the internet. Where... I mean, we could have looked it up, but I don't think we really, we didn't, neither of us had computers at the time that really had access to the internet. You had that old tower, which remember had exactly a one gigabyte hard drive. I th- I think it was two. Two. Two gigabytes. And we played yep. Star Wars Galactic Battlegrounds on mm-hmm. it. That was a great game. It was, yes. It's fantastic. But yeah, that was uh, before I had any sort of internet connection. Uh, yep, that, that's what it was. So we didn't have any internet back then. Yeah. That's kind of funny. It's so long ago. Oh, God, know, we're it's, old. <laughs> it's so weird looking back at games and... This is way off topic. Uh, but, that's fine. We can... I um, was just watching a video that mentioned the Dreamcast and how it like never really took off as much as it should have. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking, you know, when that came out, I was still playing my PlayStation. I didn't have the internet. I didn't... I had no idea the Dreamcast even existed until it was already gone. Only reason I knew it existed was because... Do you remember that kid, Chris Lynch? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I probably shouldn't have said I'll, Maybe I'll edit it out. <laughs> <laughs> that kid, rant, <laughs> rant. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, he had, I remember when I used to go over to his house and he had Nintendo 64, Sega Dreamcast, and PlayStation. And I was like, you are the king of video games. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I mean, I just, I remember the only game I played on the Dreamcast was Crazy Taxi for a while, but... I, I mean, now I have a Dreamcast for my, you know, with me and my collecting and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, uh, so how did we get off on topic? We were talking about that we're, we're old now. Right, about <laughs> about uh, looking up skill oh, points yeah. on Well, we were in, like, I mean, okay, we're not actually old. Like, we're 25, 26, right around there. So we're not, we're really not old. But, like, we grew up in the time when, it, like, we had that bizarre transition where, like, when we were kids, we didn't have the internet at all. And when we were adults, like, now we have it. Like, we grew up in the transition from no internet to internet. Mm-hmm. I mean, technically, it existed in the early 90s, but, like, that you had to actually know how to program and you, like, really know how to work a computer as opposed to just by clicking Internet Explorer mm. or by plugging in a USB, like, wireless card. Booting up the old AOL mm-hmm. startup disks. And then hearing the dial-up tone. Yeah. Uh, which I remember I... How did... Uh, I remember I tried... Back when we still played RuneScape, horrible game. I can't do... I don't know. I mean, okay, I shouldn't say it's horrible. Maybe there's a, there's still people that play it, so there maybe there's something to it. It's just not for me. You know, to its credit, I think... I think it's either RuneScape three or four that they're up to now. Um, is apparently really good, but I, I still think the RuneScape that we played, I would just like that summer of my life back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. We had a good fun time. Yeah, but like, it was okay. I remember I would try to play it at home on dial-up, and it just 
Nope. Mm-hmm. Did not. And when, the first time we got DSL, like the $15 a month DSL, I had to talk my parents into it. I'm like, we got to get fast internet so I can play RuneScape. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> RuneScape! Uh, you get it for me! <laughs> get indignant with them. <coughs> okay, so back on topic. Um, any other things for Up Your Arsenal? Let's see. We talked about the cool new gadgets we talked about the uh, the new weapon upgrade systems the uh, ranger kind of battlefield ranger battlefield things, yeah. yeah you um, also I... met Kronk and zephyr for the first time on this didn't you or some uh, something similar to them yeah i mean, I think it was just kind of your generic like army buddies yeah that was before they actually had that and that was basically the like the I'm just blanking on the word I was going to use. Like, the the model for Kronk and Zephyr, like, those char- yeah. it was like a character model. Not totally. the physical character model of, like, what they used in-game, but, like, the type of characters they are. Um, there is one thing I'd like to address. Mm-hmm. In Going Commando, spoilers, um, the scientist that you track down that has taken the weird pet thing. Yeah, what yeah, was it yeah. called? Um, Protopet, yeah. Protopet. Uh, turned out to be a female Lombax, which is, you hadn't heard of any other Lombax, which is what Ratchet is. So you figure romantic possibilities there. After that game, you never hear of her again. Was she an actual Lombax, though? I'm pr- Do they tell you? I could have sworn they said she looked like one, but she wasn't one. Okay. Well, I don't remember, though. Anyway... Um, they go into Up Your Arsenal, and he gets a new romantic interest. Who's Which like is the, 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 the princess, or not really princess, yeah, but like the daughter of the general or whatever. Right, like Admiral something's daughter. She's like yeah. the captain of your ship. Yeah. Um, and she, I think she pops up in some other games, but it's, I don't know. It's never really a thing. It no. just seemed weird to me that they kind of put her in there, but then it's like, yeah. nothing ever comes of it. Well, maybe because, like, Clank got his Courtney Gears love interest, mm. sort of. She turns out to be a bad guy. Spoilers! Too late, but... <laughs> uh, but <laughs> Fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. It's, uh, but yeah, I mean, it was a really good game. It just... it That was the last of... The, oh, no, there was one more PS2 game, and which... You actually have to do most of the talking for for Deadlocked because I have not played it. All right, so basically Deadlocked. It's not a Ratchet and Clank game per se. It's, it's just, just called Ratchet. Ratchet Deadlocked. So the deal with this is there is a I forget the channel. It's some some like big corporate guy who owns this arena fighting channel, and he captures heroes from various galaxies and pits them against each other. So his newest acquisition is Ratchet and Clank. So, uh, Ratchet is given two kind of like fighter hover bots that go into the the arena with him, and, uh, Clank is actually like his manager, and kind of... I remember, I think I remember that, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's a really good game. It's mostly based in these arena fighting kind of areas, so people who really love the platforming of the first three games might be a little disappointed, um... If you really think about it, though, it kind of points to how their like their model for the rest of the series too, because like they'll have three games in like the normal Ratchet and Clank style, and then they'll deviate. So like even in the PS3 era, I mean, it's kind of like more like two and a half instead of three. They had mm-hmm. Tools of Destruction and Crack and Time, but there was a in between one called Quest for Booty. <laughs> yeah, booty. Uh, so that was like, you know, that was like a short half an hour, 45 minute, or maybe it was like a two hour game. Yeah, it was sorry. Like a two, three hour game. Two to yeah. three hour game. So it was like, like I said, two and a half. So they had two and a half hour, like two and a half normal games. And then they went to do all for one and then uh full frontal assault. But then they came back to the normal, uh, like traditional, uh, formula and did into the Nexus. Mm-hmm. Which I don't know if we'll have time to talk about all. Of, we might have to turn this into a two parter. Okay. Okay, um, but yeah, so Deadlocked it took a a little more serious turn because they're it, they kind of deal with the death of some of the other heroes. Okay, that's um, kind of interesting. Yeah, I forget the. Not kind of. I actually I I want to go home and play it now. Yeah, I, I forget the other like headliner 
for this channel. Um, he was kind of like a Buzz Lightyear looking kind of guy, like I don't know, Blitz Fast Star or something ridiculous <laughs> like that. Um, but what? yeah. <laughs> A little off topic. Okay, so I was playing Persona Three a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I never beat it, but I what, I named my character like, "What's your name?" And I wanted to name it something as like stupid as possible. So I named my character your your whatever Blitz Lightstar, whatever you called it. Mm-hmm. Remind me of the name. I named him Boom Gunstick. Nice. <laughs> So everyone's like, hey, Boom, what's up, Boom? I'm like, oh, this stupid mother. <laughs> like, why would you, like, what kind of parent would name their child Boom and <laughs> with their last name being Gunstick? Mm. Anyway, so. Go. Okay, so his, his actual name is uh, Ace Hardlight. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, there were a few videos that you would watch, like, as commercial kind of spoiler thingies, um, of him actually killing some of the other heroes. And you can see on the, like, the ranking system, when you start, there's a whole bunch of them, and then Ace at the top. And then by the end, you've got the like big kind of tough guys that you kill, and then all the ones that Ace had killed. And it's just, you and him are the only ones on that scoreboard anymore. Everybody else is like deceased. Really? Yeah. So and it's, this is towards the end of the game, I take it? Yeah. I mean, it, it slowly happens if you check the scoreboards. But yeah, it's a lot heavier tone, but uh, it's still really good. still has some of that... But you see, humor. that's what I think is so good about the series is that they can take such a comical tone, but they can also go really serious, and you would totally believe it. Mm-hmm. Um, that was it. Like, I really want to go home and play that now. That might be my next game to like sit down. I have it a free digital HD copy. And I have it on the PS2 still, but why do that when you get the free HD? Yeah. yeah. Um, Especially when you could play Network with me. That's true. Mm. That's true. That'll have to happen then. Uh, maybe that can go up as a live stream sometime. Too. Okay. That'd be fun. Um, all right, so, uh, anything else you wanted to talk about with Deadlocked, or did you... Um, I think that about covers it. All right, um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, the next one, we're, instead of jumping to the PS3, they're gonna be the one that I'm talking about, is Mm -hmm. Size Matters for the PSP. Right, so I did not have a PSP, so I have literally no experience with either of these games. Well, I've not played, okay, I've played about the first level of Secret Agent Clank. I'll, I'll be. I'll talk about Secret, Secret Agent Client quick, just because I can be quick with it. I don't know much else mm-hmm. about it, uh, but it's really interesting the way it works. He all he really has is like, um, like you can punch and stuff like that. But like, uh, it, the whole game, it's a stealth game basically. You have to sneak around defenses and things like that. I mean, I only played the first level. You're sneaking into a museum to find, because basically the storyline goes, which so far in that game is that Ratchet. Um, steals some precious artifact from a museum, and Clank's like, what's going on? And you see in Ratchet's head that he's got some weird machine. So it's obviously he's being mind-controlled by someone. You don't know who. Um, and so he goes into the museum where Ratchet just got caught stealing something to try to find evidence to lead back to whatever. So that's a... I literally... It's within the first 10, 15 minutes of the game. So I've barely touched it. I just... I, it was interesting. Like, you can... Uh, you... There's just a lot of interesting interesting things you can do with it so, so far, it seems like, just the stealth aspect. So if if I can play more of it before, if we actually turn this into a two-parter, if I can play more of it before the second part, then I'll go with them. But as of right now, I don't know much about it. A little bit of, like, Metal Gear Clank going on there. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Well, literally, metal. Yeah, yeah. That was a bad joke. I'm going to file that. And, well, hey, his, the C in his name is a gear, right? So, uh, uh, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Ratchet & Clank Size Matters uh, is a PSP exclusive. Well, it was exclusive. It got ported to the PS2. Um, it's a pretty fun game. It's, it, it really holds up as a Ratchet & Clank game on its own. Um Basically, the premise of it is is that you ratchet like gets asked to like do something by this little girl who asks him to save him. Turns out, uh, spoilers, it's not much of a plot. So even for you, Tristan, who hasn't not really played it, uh, you find out that the little girl is actually a little robot controlled by these things called technomites, which they you know they're tired of basically building all the technology in the world and not getting credit, so they fight back. So the end of the game literally is you fighting the techno white leader but you're like a little 
tiny version because he has a shrink ray, so he shrinks himself to fight the Technomites. Okay, cool. Um, so there's not there's not really anything cool with like you know like oh look it's small ratchet and here's tiny gig- or here's here's tiny ratchet with gigantic boxes and stuff like that. So I was kind of bummed out that it was like that, but it was still really fun. Um, your weapons do upgrade. There was um. Like, there's a trippy dream sequence in it, which I actually hated because it was impossible to see anything. But it had some cool ideas. A really solid, like, game. It wasn't developed by Insomniac. It was developed by High Impact Games, I think. Yep, you're right. Um, but they did a really... It's obviously in association with Insomniac. But interesting thing I found out. You know how, like, they always have in those other games, like, Break a Snowdan, and it's, like, that, that skill point, mm. to, you find a snowman, and in, um, Into the Nexus, they have this big statue you can find in, like, the Museum of Dan Johnson. D- did you find that in Into the Nexus? Oh, I don't know. I'm gonna have to run through it again. It's, it literally does nothing for you in the game. It's just an Easter egg. Uh, but Dan Johnson was a programmer in Insomniac, which I was unaware of until a couple weeks ago, which I feel bad I should have known, considering I'm a Ratchet and Clank fan. Mm. But this game is in de- Size Matters is in dedication to him, because he died during the development of it, or like know, okay. right before it. Same with Deadlocked, I believe? I think so. Um, but Size Matters, I mean, there's not much to it. It was about an eight-hour game, so it was kind of short. Oh, not really short, but like that's. Yeah, I mean, uh, not not bad for a handheld. That's a game. very good for a handheld. I mean, Uncharted yeah. games are eight hours long, mm-hmm. uh, but I I thoroughly enjoyed it. It I will say though, it is tough as hell. <laughs> it is stupid hard. The final boss I barely beat. He killed me at the scene. I killed him a second, like a split second before he killed me. So I was able to complete the game, but it doesn't have a cut and cutscene. Maybe I have to. I mean, is there one? I don't know. I have to check YouTube mm-hmm. still. But, um, yeah, I mean, not too much else to talk about Size Matters, but it was a damn good game. Damn good game. So if you have a PSP, definitely give it a play. Uh, let's move on to the PS3. All right. Which so. is the final the final frontier. We might actually fit this all in here. Let me see what our running time is. So a possible part two. I think... We can do it all now. We, we could. Uh, it's going to be close because we're already running a... At about 40 minutes or so, 45, I don't know, we'll find out when, after I edit everything right. out. Yeah, we, I mean, we can blaze through these. We could um, we could talk this for another 45 minutes. We could definitely get... So let's start out with uh, Tools of Destruction. Now, I will say, I, out of all of these, these are the ones I have played... I mean, I've beaten them all, but I I played them the longest ago. Mm-hmm. That makes That's yes. really bad English, but... Uh, Tools of Destruction was awesome. I always love the one, if you look on the back of it, the New York Times, I love this review. The first game to truly deliver the long sought, you are playing, in quotes, you are playing a Pixar movie experience. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with that. It had, uh, what was it, Emperor Tachyon, right? Percival Tachyon. Mm -hmm. They always make fun of him because his name's Percival. Um, And he's part of, oh gosh, what's what's the villain? What is like, he's... I forget what it is. What's his What's his racist name? Are you, are you on? Can you see it on your laptop? Uh, a Cragmite. That's it. That's it. And he Cragmite, according to this game's lore, or to this universe's lore, was they had a war against the Lombaxes, which is you know Ratchet's race. And so he was a Tachyon. You find out spoilers. All spoilers. Uh, <laughs> Was You've raised had several years to play these games, so you know. Yeah, sorry for the spoilers, but come on, go fuck yourself. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, audience. Um, no, uh, Tachyon got raised by Lombaxes, but then once he found out what the Kragmites what was that, was that mm-hmm. right? The Kragmites that the about the war between the Kragmites and the um, freaking uh, and the Lombaxes, he basically went rogue and just you know restart reignited the war the the war and try to hunt down the last of the lombaxes yeah i think there was something about uh the lombaxes and the cragmites being trapped in different dimensions and oh yeah i I think that was percival tachyon's end goal was to get this like rift ripper kind of thing to bring all the cragmites out of there Um, okay yeah, he had, like, a weird helmet with, like, a giant 
He looked orb ridiculous on the top. Yeah, he, in general. Absolutely ridiculous. And all the all the Kragmites were like really squishy. It was like squishies with robotic bodies. Doctor Nefarious would have loved it. Yeah, they were uh Yeah, they were like fish kind of, right? Yeah. Like in little fishbowl <laughs> helmets on <laughs> these could, big like, mechs. And after you kill them they were like flopping around on the ground. If you killed them they gave you bolts. So. Yeah, yeah. I love how everything gives you bolts. You can hit a plant and you get a bunch of bolts. I'm like, what? how are you hiding this? <laughs> you know, some of the plants are actually made of metal. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. But, I uh, love this series. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for the uh, the Ratchet and Clank Future series, which I is... I guess we could just kind of bundle these all together because I, I mean, like, honestly, the Future series had a phenomenal storyline. Mm-hmm. Crack in time, especially. Yeah, um, I was a little late to the party on these, um, so I think, I think Tools of Destruction, I'm pretty sure, came out in 2007? I forget. Yeah, 2007. Um, I didn't get my PS3 until about 2009, 2010. Was it really that long ago? Mm Mm-hmm. I feel like it wouldn't... Gosh, we've had our PS3s for a while. I remember buying my PS3, because this was before I had a credit card. I bought it from Walmart with a check. Nice. I wrote a check, and everyone's like, who the hell writes checks anymore? <laughs> They're like, I guess we'll take this. We've never had to take a check before. <laughs> <laughs> well, GameStop doesn't take checks at all anymore. Ah. So I went, originally went to GameStop, which now, you know, after working there, I don't know why I decided to give them business. Mm. I hate GameStop. But, uh, but anyway, so the Tools of Destruction game, I had actually borrowed from you, and I think you slept over... You played and I just played all night. I woke up to you still playing Tools of Destruction. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure I did go to sleep even after you left, and I beat the game later that day. And that was the only that was the only time that I went through it. So I'm I'm a little foggy on it, but I just I remember it being good. It was a really good game. I even I just remember the cutscenes were really cool from what I remember. I also. Remember, that's where, like, uh, Captain Quark starts to real like, he comes back to help you out. I guess he doesn't really start helping you out. He did that in the third one as well. But, um, I do remember, like, that's where my favorite cuts, one of my favorite cutscenes is where he, like, he gives you his, cr- like, crown, crown drawn plan. That's a tongue twister there. Uh, of, like, how you're going to infiltrate some secret base and he code names you dead meat and you have to swim through, like, laser sharks and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. I don't remember the exact thing. I, you can just find... You can YouTube a bunch of these, and they're amazing. They're all amazing. Um, but the whole uh, Ratchet & Clank Future series was... It was Tools of Destruction, then Quest for Booty, which was like the DLC side game, and then Crack and Dime. And then they rounded off the full thing with Into the Nexus, apparently. I think it's called... No, just Ratchet and Clank. It's Ratchet and Clank. Well, from what I was reading, some I forget where, but it's supposed to finish off the future series. Like it, it rounds it off before you know the PS4. They're basically rebooting the whole franchise. Yeah, they're rebooting the whole franchise. Yeah, which mm-hmm. is weird. I've never really seen a game get reboot after you know the last game was still, like all the games are remote are pretty much popular like they always sell i don't i don't think they've lost money on a ratchet and clank game yet yeah it's it's kind of I mean, like I the spider-man know. movies where they just finished off a trilogy and they're like let's start a new spider-man series yeah, yeah. like i don't know well um, hopefully i mean i didn't like the most recent spider-man movies okay. i tried to yeah i i lost interest after two so, so. um but anyway yeah so uh well i was going to say unlike those i'm looking forward to the next install yes absolutely uh, so, Tools of Destruction was very good. Um, it really stayed close to the the basis of the original trilogy and Deadlocked and how that all... all a lot of the mechanics are totally the same, same kind of gadgets. Uh, a couple new weapons that were really cool, but overall, the same deal. Yeah. Now, Quest for Booty, which... It, it, booty! Yeah. <laughs> it's an okay game. Um, but I want to give a credit for some of the innovations that it introduces that Crack in Time really runs with, such as, uh, your, like, magnetic wrench. Yeah. Because there's various puzzles with that. You would, like, throw it up and have to, like, well, not, but, like, yeah. throw the wrench. <laughs> with your arm, not your... <laughs> not your... Bruh. Bruh. Yeah. And, like, it, you would have to use it to, like, you know, rotate different, like, rotate different screws, like, 
um, screw in different screws so it mm. would like do something. Because that's one of the common. It's not really much of a puzzle, but it's still fun to do. In Ratchet and Clank, like the whole series, I'm surprised we didn't talk about this before. You'll just see random screws sticking out of the ground where Ratchet goes up with his big wrench and just twists them. Mm. And that's a puzzle. Hooks them in and runs in a circle. Yeah. I mean, I don't know why, but it's satisfying. It just. It is like it, it, they don't they don't do it a lot. It's not like they're like, this is our you know like hook. This is how we get the kids these days with all the screwing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was uh, it was always interesting because you really, in order to do it, you just kind of hit the button. So you're holding on to it, and then you just bring your joystick around in circles. That's and it. Doesn't matter how fast you do it. He always goes at the same speed. But still, whenever you do it, you try to do it real fast, thinking that it's going to happen quicker. Yeah. It never works, but it's it's surprisingly satisfying for such a stupid mechanic, but hey, it it's part of the game series. One thing, I'm surprised we haven't really covered it either. I'm going to say that a thousand times. Clearly, we should have written out notes for ourselves before this. <laughs> but, uh... Improv everything. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I love their aesthetic, like the art aesthetic of everything. Like, they have, you know, a Ratchet and Clank game, not just by, like, the, the dialogue and the humor in it, but also by the world that they create. Like, you, it feels like a, it's almost like a bizarre modern steampunk, you know? Yeah, a little bit. Like, everything's kind of got gears and a little bit more technology, but at the same time, it's very colorful and bright. Steampunk's usually very dark. Like, it's got lots mm. of, you usually see lots of browns and like stuff, but this is all like brightly colored, lots of blues and greens. And yeah, it's it's oranges. somewhere somewhere between steam and cyberpunk. Yeah, it's I love it. I love the their art style in all the games. Like everything, always it it always feels like a ratchet. Like I love the feel of it because it just makes you happy to play it. It makes mm-hmm. you want to be in that world. Now, granted, I think for us, a lot of that might just be the nostalgia. Nope, it's true. Okay. <laughs> Don't care. Um, yeah, I mean, whenever I boot up a new Ratchet and Clank game, I'm immediately smiling because it's just it's bringing just back all those old memories of the, the original games. Well, like just... the thing is, the thing is, if it was just straight nostalgia, we wouldn't like Into the Nexus. But Into the Nexus, it was a pretty actually. It got some. There were some dark moments in Into the Nexus, mm-hmm. which we'll cover. Which spoilers, big spoilers for when that when we get to that. I'm not gonna like people die. Stop listening now if you don't want the spoilers. Yeah, for, for or, or just well keep everything. Listening. It's fine. Um, I don't know how many times we can like. No matter how many times you say spoilers, everyone's going to be like, "You suck! Why did you tell me this?" Yes. Like, all, were you really all gonna... twelve people that are going to listen to? It. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> were you really going to play the game tomorrow? Really, mm. really. But um, I mean, I know we're not saying much about the the future series, but like it was the one we played the longest ago. We really should have brushed up on it, I guess, but. There's a lot of games we had to cover. I'm trying to get most of this in in like an hour and a half or so. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be a nice long episode, but that's good. Um, so one of my other things I really liked about Crack in Time, though, the the final game, we're going to, like I said, we're kind of kind of talking about the future trilogy all together. You know, F- Tools of Destruction, Quest for Booty, and Crack in Time. Um, Crack in Time I really liked with all the clank like clock puzzles. Like it was a lot of time manipulation puzzles. Those were really fun, and I remember one of the ways I platinumed that once. One of the few games I platinumed on the PS3, you had to beat all the all the clock puzzles, and one of the one of the um, just thinking about like the names of the games mm. uh, on that uh, video for on your whatever you know, uh, did you know gaming or whatever. One of the alternative titles for Crack in Time before they named it was going to be Clock Blockers, <laughs> <laughs> which fits in so perfectly. Very good. Um, Very good. I just thought about that now. What a great name! But um, all the time puzzles with Clank. So Ratchet was off doing other stuff with Quark at the time, and you're like trying to fix stuff with Cl- or with Clank and the Zony. The yes. Little, I don't know, so it's the, kind of like the Martians from Toy Story. Yeah. The, uh, this was another one that was kind of like Deadlocked, where Ratchet and Clank are split up. Um, so that was another really cool thing they added with this, where you can be Ratchet, and you have your like rocket boots and stuff, so you don't really feel like you're missing Clank, because mm-hmm. you can still do everything. And then you have Clank doing his cool like time puzzles. There was a lot of fun stuff. Mm-hmm. In that. The storyline was really good in A Crack in Time. Yeah, this is definitely 
in my opinion, probably the best game of the series. Really? Yeah. Um, as much as I love going Commando for all the things that I did for the series, I think that Kraken Time really brought everything together, and that's like the pinnacle of the series. I really hope like the new the remake's gonna be good. It looks good from the from like the you know the previews we've been seeing. Oh my god! It looks and it looks so pretty. Good. Looks really pretty. You're gonna have to get a PS4. I uh, hey man, Black Friday this that's this November. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, anything really else on the on the future trilogy though? Because there's just I like that it's a trilogy. I don't know why. I just like that it's called the future trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, being on a at that point next generation system. The graphics got a lot better. They were really pretty. Um, I love what they did with it, though, where they kind of kept it cartoony, but they got really detailed with it. Mm-hmm. So you, it had, like, wonderful hair textures and stuff. and Or, I guess, fur. Fur. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. But, tomato, uh, tomato. But, yeah, it just really... The whole world felt alive. And I look forward to see what they can do on the PS4. Um, I guess, though, we'll move on to the two uh, red-headed stepchilds of the series. It's the red-headed stepchildren, I mean. Um, All for One and Full Frontal Assault. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't played... I've actually not beaten All for One, now that I think about it. Yeah, we uh, we sat down a couple times. We and, got far And played through some pretty big chunks of it, and then just kind of dropped it and never went back to it. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. It's yeah. very different because the camera is completely different than the old ones. It's not like focusing on any one character. It's almost kind of like God of War style where it just follows you. It's a station. It, mm-hmm. Like it's fixated at the focal point of all the characters together. Like whatever's the center of all four of them. Right. So no matter can, it's four player co op, which is the first time in Ratchet and Clank. Right. Yeah. So it's no matter how many players you have, the camera is going to be in the same place. Mm. relatively speaking yeah um as long as it can fit all the characters on screen i remember the first boss we reached was the one where like you had it was like a bunch of tiles and he would send like waves of like you know electricity things that you have to jump over while also shooting so i just remember how crazy was that you couldn't really control the camera it was one of the most hectic boss fights i've ever been in but it was one of the most fun i've ever been in too yeah it's, uh, I really want to get a group of four people together just to play this all the way, like, one-shot it. Yeah, the most I've played it with was three, and we actually, it's, it was me and then two of our friends who are not Ratchet and Clank fans at all. Um, they did, played, like, very limited amounts. Did they like it? Yeah, they really, well, I think they liked it. Maybe they were just humoring me, but, <laughs> but I was having a great time. So. They leave the house like, fucking stupid. Yeah, they're like, oh, never bring that game over again, but... I'll have to, we really ought to, like, you know, sit down and try to play it again. Uh, but All for One was really cool just because it was the first four, like, it was a co-op game. Like, I know, like you said, Deadlocked, you could play two-player, but this is a four-player co-op game, which Ratchet & Clank has never really had. Mm-hmm. And I still think has not had since. Um, no, looking at the case now, I'm surprised it's 3D compatible. Yeah, that is pretty I mean, cool. I always think it was interesting that the PlayStation decided to go 3D gaming a little bit. Like, I've seen 3D gaming at, like, at GameStop, but it's just, it like, 3D TVs are so expensive. Yeah, you know, they're not too bad anymore. Sony did offer one for a little while where, like, if it was, like, $200 for, like, a 24-inch 1080p 3D TV. Yes, the, the PlayStation TV, I believe they called it. Uh, when they originally released it, it was, like, 500 bucks, and nobody bought it. Yep, and then it very quickly dropped down to two hundred, and I almost bought one. Had it had some yeah. marginal success, I bet. Mm-hmm. But um, all for one was pretty cool. I mean, we can't talk much more about because we never really beat it, but it was a fun game. Uh, one thing that I really liked about it, um, as long as everyone is using the same weapon on the same target, oh yeah, it kind of like boosts yeah. up the ability. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you remember the Morpho Ray or like. Paco Blitzer, or Sheepinator, or whatever for all, all the other games. Um, I forget what the new one's called, but alone you can transform like the little guys into just random little creatures. Yeah. Um, as a group, you can actually transform the bosses into like. It just takes giant a long time, yeah. but it's still really cool. Yeah. That was a fun game. I mean, well, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that, 
but it's it is a really good game. It's, it it like I said, it's kind of like a redheaded stepchild because not a lot of people like. It. If you give it a chance, that and they change the art style up. Ratchet looks a little different in this one. Yeah, it was. They kind of went even more cartoony. More almost. cartoony. They got rid of that detail that I really liked in Kraken Time, mm-hmm. which it's okay. It's still it's still a cool art style. I still love the characters. It's just like they were kind of going for a younger audience this time. Definitely. Um, the uh, one of the other nicknames from that video is they were gonna call this one foreplay. Foreplay. Oh. <laughs> See, that's that's good. That's um not quite as like on, on the, the head as like yeah. foursome, but I don't think they ever called it foursome. I think it was just foreplay. Okay. Well, that yeah, I like. I still it. like clock blockers for yeah, clock blockers <laughs> for cracking time. Um, in a then, different world, maybe the. <laughs> Redheaded step, the other redheaded stepchild one was um, the, the full frontal assault. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was really fun. We had a lot of fun with that game. Yeah, that was um, their take on a tower defense. It was a third person tower defense game. Shoot them up too. Yeah, kind of like what was the other one? Sanctum, I think that tried that. That was first person shooter too, wasn't right, it? Right. Yeah, yeah. That was first person tower defense kind of stuff. But I just remember we we spent a lot of time in full frontal as well that i was determined dirtier than i was. yeah right <laughs> um i was the, determined to get that platinum we st- you're still only one trophy away right yeah you the, still owe me one free victory on um on an online on, match, on yeah, online match. Yeah. uh but the, the to get the platinum there's a game called what the marathon man or something like that yeah where you have to hover boot the equivalent of like 10 miles which is obscene mm-hmm. like i don't know how you're supposed to get that yeah, it's just like any time you're moving, you need to be hover booting because yeah. you're never gonna get it. It it's insane, and you have to like jump and hover like a, like two miles or something like that. They're not that far. That might be the one that I'm I'm missing. I think there's like three different modes of transportation you need to do a certain distance. Distance, in, yeah. I'm pretty sure I have two of them complete, and it's the like hover glide one. Yeah, that for I don't like have. Two, for like a mile or something, it yeah. takes a long time. But um. Yeah, so Full Frontal was cool because you could build your own towers and whatnot, or get your own defense turrets, and we kind of got it down to a science when we were playing co-op on it. Had a really good sense of humor. Like, all the, like, I will never forget, so one of the best weapons game was the Groovatron. You could throw it up in the air, all the enemies would dance. We were just like, I wonder if we could get the, we were at the final boss, and we were like, I wonder if we could get the final boss to dance. And this was, came out in 2012, so it was like, what, like, it, we got released like six months after Gundam style got mm-hmm. went big, the big and, K-pop explosion, the big K-pop explosion, and so we threw a Groovatron on the boss, and he was doing the Gundam style dance. We're like, "Are you shitting me? Like, yeah. what? How did they did that in like barely any time before the game got released? Like, that's a big, not a big change where they threw that animation in like you know five months before the game mm-hmm. came out. That's amazing. And I mean, I it was probably easy for them to do, I guess, but they still decided to take the time and do it like right before release. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool. That was the Groovatron in general. is just a wonderful attention to detail because every different enemy has a different dance. Mm-hmm. And it was always cool where you're like, wait, have we used the Groovatron on this guy before? Because we need to see what his dance well, is. Well, it was also an achievement to use a Groovatron on every single enemy. Mm-hmm. And then it would distract them so you could kill them. And, <laughs> like are we just friendly people yeah. <laughs> here dance now die uh all the weapons were pretty cool i mean i mean they start out generic but the groovatron is always a favorite um you get the agents of doom again i think mr zircon mr mr zircon's my favorite mr zircon no knee bolts his only currency is pain <laughs> I loved all his one-liners. He was literally just the Arnold Schwarzenegger of Ratchet and Clank. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it had a good sense of humor in general. Like the villain, I do you remember uh, <laughs> when he hacks into the ship and he he like he's like I decided to play this song on loop for you and it's a troll the little, little song. Uh, it was there were so many moments in this game where it was like this is pretty cool. It's not the normal Ratchet and Clank, but it's pretty cool. And then you'd reach one of those points where it was just, like, huge smile on my face, enjoying every second of this, <laughs> yeah. like, their pop culture references. It was great. There was a ton in that game. Yeah. Too. There was a yeah. lot of pop culture references in Full Frontal. And it was just a really fun game all around. Just, I, 
I remember even playing by myself trying to, like, I just enjoyed hover booting around. I would set up the defenses on the easiest level so I wouldn't have to worry about the enemies. I just hover boot trying to get the achievement. Still haven't gotten it, but I have it. I have, that's the easiest way to do it, I mm-hmm. think. You just go around in circles over and over and over and over again. Um, but it had a great sense of humor. The gameplay was a ton of fun. The The turrets were okay. Yeah. The bosses got pretty difficult. Like, when you had the boss and the actual tower defense thing, that mm-hmm. got pretty difficult because they would make you split your attention up a lot and you had to be really careful yeah um some of the tower defense stuff would get a little annoying because it's like even if you put all your money into one lane it would still sometimes need your attention and it was just kind of juggling that would get a little annoying especially when you went around run around and find the secrets Mm -hmm. but that's why i I think it's a lot more fun with two players oh yeah it's a ton more fun with two players um I don't have much else to say on Full Front. Do you have yeah. anything? Um, just that I enjoyed it enough that if they wanted to sneak that in as like a mini game or something in one of the later releases, I would be okay with that. Just, I agree. just putting it out there, Insomniac. If you if you wanted to do that, that'd be cool. If you listen to this ten, you know, this podcast that maybe ten people listen to, mm-hmm. take it to heart and <laughs> put a little mini. That would be a cool mini game. Like maybe that that could be like the arena mode. Instead of having the normal arena, they could do that as the arena. Okay. That would be kind of cool, right? Or maybe one I mean, of the arenas. you know, I still like the, the arenas, but I would, I'd be down for, for everything. All-inclusive game with every mini They game could probably fit games. it on there. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to Into the Nexus, the last game of the series. I mean, there are there is one that else that we have not really talked about. It was the, the other mobile game they have. There's two mobile games that Ratchet & Clank has. There's one Ratchet & Clank going mobile, which, like I said, I can't find a copy of anywhere because it's for really old phones. Uh, The other one, what was it called? It was Before the Nexus, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and it's just like an endless runner game. So, you know, Temple Run, that kind of thing. But with a very... It's definitely very Ratchet & Clank from what I saw you playing on it. Yeah, I, I downloaded it on my phone literally 10 minutes before we started this podcast to... Or whatever we're calling this. Yeah, podcast. Whatever. It's a podcast. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's definitely got the the good 3D aesthetic. Um, controls are a little clunky, but that might just be my phone. Um, yeah, it could just be the, the, har- the hardware specs on your phone. Too. Yeah, definitely better on a bigger screen. But uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's free. It's fine. So it's, it's free, so give it a shot. I mean, we don't have much else to say about it. It's a... It's a endless runner what else do you have to really go on yeah it, w- it was really just a promotion for into the nexus uh-huh. itself which i didn't hear about because we my little bit i was like let's see what wikipedia has to say about ratchet and clank and it mentioned i'm like what the hell is this i've never seen this before um so into the nexus the most recent game in the series and by all means i think it's a pretty good one it's definitely not the best but it was a that, that's what they should have released on Ratchet and Clank's 10th anniversary instead of Full Frontal. While I did enjoy Full Frontal, they didn't really release a brand new classic Ratchet and Clank, Ratchet and Clank, Ratchet and Clank adventure. It's a really tall Clank, <laughs> <laughs> and he just kind of like his arms flop everywhere, yeah. and he's really loud. Um, I liked uh, Into the Nexus a lot. It had a really it had a pretty cool backstory to the villains. Um, General, the animation was gorgeous on it like everything like the frame rate was really crisp so everything looked really nice mm-hmm. um the puzzle solving was a lot it, there was a, they focused more on puzzle puzzle solving in that one did you notice that uh yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed it because there was like what was it was it was it the gravity gun or i forget what it was but like you could shoot basically like it's almost like the, the puzzles would be a series of mirrors, and what you would shoot, it would get a portal of gravity, almost like Portal itself. Yeah, and uh, in Portal Two, they have I forget they're like gravity reinforcement beams or something. Well, didn't they have it in Portal One too, with like the little blue beams going across the screen? They had it in Portal One, did they? I thought so. Maybe they did. Portal Two, they added in the goo things that you would just oh. right. Yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. It's been but a while since I first. It's kind of it's been yeah. a while, but <laughs> it's kind of like it's kind of like that um where you would have like a gravity I think they had that in there. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they definitely did. Um so they had stuff like that. They had what other get what other like puzzle things did they choose? I mean, I just remember it was a lot more in- puzzle intensive. But the storyline was pretty unique. There was just basically like two villains like 
the one villain i forget her name already but you're um i shouldn't say the story is unique it was just it was short it was a short and sweet game and they only charge is like what 20 bucks for the game too yeah i think it was 30 was it like 29.99 it was it was cheap yeah like and it so was, it definitely i definitely felt like i got my money's worth I don't know why Sony doesn't do that more. Back in the PlayStation games, instead of games being sixty dollars a piece, it was fifty for a brand new game. And games they weren't quite sure, like, like uh, you know, Pa uh, Pa Rappa the rapper or whatever, mm-hmm. that was like a forty dollar game. It was like experimental games. They would be like, well, this didn't cost us too much to make, so here's a forty dollar game. I honestly think they should do that more often. They'll sell so many. Like, yeah, it's not going to sell a lot of units, but they're going to make money on it. So what's the problem? You know? Yeah, I think that's happening more. If you get games like uh, like Killing Floor Two, I think is forty bucks. Um, See, and they really should do that more often because um, these big budget games like are ruining companies. Like Bioshock Infinite was a huge success; like it sold tons of copies, but it's still bankrupt to rational games. Really? Wow. Yeah, because it was just well it. It, they sunk so much money into it to recoup the cost. They had to sell an obscene amount of units, like unrealistically high. Mm. And it's the same. That's why. Why do you think Call of Duty doesn't iterate? Because it's expensive to iterate. That, yeah, absolutely. It's very expensive to create it. And like, I guess we complain about all the complacency. I know I'm going off on a small tangent here. We complain about the complacency of um, like AAA games, but. If you think about it, like it's just so expensive to make games now because of the demands of the consumer. Mm. Like we expect like good voice acting, we expect like high like solid frame rates and good animation and all this other stuff. Um, so I think studios are going to have to really. This has nothing to do with the Ratchet and Clank. Hey, that's okay, man. I'll, I, I'll jump in on this too. I think studios really need to find a way to like iterate on, well, like create something new, but not spend like. Make smaller games, which they already are doing anyway, and just figure out... they got to figure out how to spend less money, but make good games still. That's why I think, like, what Ratchet & Clank was... Like, what Insomniac was doing is smart. Because, like, their last big budget game, Fuse, flopped hardcore. Yeah. But all their small games are still, like, they have recognition on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, right now you've got your AAA titles, where they charge 60 bucks, And then you have your indie titles, which are, like, 20 bucks and below. And you have this weird area in the middle that is either a game like into the nexus where it's it's very good but it's a little bit shorter or you have ones that are like the company's not too sure that it's that good and they'll only charge 40 bucks for it i think that's how the deadpool game was um didn't get great reviews but they're like yeah it's 40 so it's okay so i think that's the caveat where if someone sees a game that they would think is usually 60 in like the market as it is now um as like 40 or 50 they might get a little hesitant and be like oh why aren't they charging me that extra or maybe they'll bucks? be a little bit more lenient with reviewing it like well, it was only 40 50 bucks i don't mind paying that for this yeah yeah um, um i i when, I'm, when i was talking to some friends for ideas on podcast topics one was talking about what what, what about like will the indie game market the rise of the indie game market bring the crash of a triple a market is that a possibility? Like, could that happen? That's an interesting conversation. Although... I don't think so. Yeah, I think there's always going to be a place for... Triple A. Indie games and triple A games. Oh, yeah. I'm glad indie games are on the rise. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't... To be honest, I'm not a huge fan of indie, fan of indie games. Like, I res, obviously, I respect the people. That's a lot of work to make a video game. I went to school for game design, and I'm too lazy to do it. So I understand how much work really goes involved, it goes into a game. But... Um, I it's just a lot of the times indie games are just not my cup of tea. The few that I've enjoyed are like Terraria, mm-hmm. Minecraft. Um, I have not beaten it, but Shovel Knight, Shovel Knight's awesome. I've heard very good things. I love Shovel Knight. Um, stuff like that, and like those games are great. Uh, but like not, a lot of indie games, they're they're very niche. They're mm-hmm. very hard. Like you have a very small audience for them. Um, but I mean, they can afford that if they're exactly because it doesn't. It's not a big budget. Mm-hmm. That's why games from AAA's are play tested to hell because they need to. They need to recoup their lo- their expenses, so they have to appeal to the biggest audience possible. Though, like 
some like that's why I still respect Naughty Dog as a AAA developer because like while Uncharted is becoming a bit for me like I love it like but it's definitely kind of becoming their Call of Duty which mm-hmm. this is going to be their last one so it's not like they're going to milk it for all it's worth. I mean, some people are like, they're milking it now. Stop making them. But I I, I would buy another Uncharted. I don't care. I love those games. Yeah, man. I, I don't but care, like, man. I'll go up to Uncharted 7 if they made it. But, but I like, respect, respect them for But, yeah. like, Last of Us, that was a huge risk. Because they, remember, as you hear the stories, they got they were playtesting it. And audiences, like the playtesters, or, like, the, the focus groups or whatever, hated the ending. Mm-hmm. But then the was it Neil Druckmann, right? I think he was the writer. I can't remember. The, I think it was Neil Druckmann. He was like, "Nope, we're sticking with the ending anyway," and that's the ending that's in the game. And mm-hmm. everyone like everyone loves it. The critics adore that ending, and for good reason. It's a damn good ending, which I, we won't spoil that in this episode. <laughs> we'll spoil that on the next episode. Exactly. <laughs> um, um, wow, we went off topic, but that was a good. I, um, so yes. They need to stick it more like Ratchet and Clank because, like, I mean, they should make more games along, like, obviously not in the same style because that, like, you want to have variety. But, like, with that same type of mindset, like, we're only going to charge 40 for this. Let's make a shorter, like, 8 to 10 hour game. That's all people really have time for anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, for even the hardcore gamers, like, I have a full time job. I'm doing, like, and now that I, I'm, I, I just. Got, I'm a supervisor or whatnot. I have to do overtime, so I don't have time to play 40-hour games like on RPGs. I don't have time to. It's hard for me to even get bu- uh, buckled down into a 20-hour game, let alone like, I I mean, just anything else longer than that. Like I said, mm-hmm. so I mean, I started. I, I'm starting to play Final Fantasy three on the Super Nintendo. That's taking me a long time because it's just it's they're long games. Yeah, I had my. My brief moment after graduating college where I thought, I'll, I'll take a couple weeks to just, just do me stuff, and dumped, like, two weeks straight into The Witcher 3. And I have no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can't see myself doing that a lot in the future when you, know, you're, you have a full-time job, and it's like, there's just not time for that. So, like, these $40 games are, would be perfect. Like, Into the Nexus was, what, like, 8, 10 hours or so? Uh, yeah. Maybe eight. That's, like, a perfect amount for, like, a $40 game. Like, you don't feel like you're getting... Like, like that's why I don't like Call of Duty, because I don't like the multiplayer. And the single player is only five hours long. I'm not paying $60 for a five-hour campaign. Yeah, that's... It especially stings, because I enjoy the Call of Duty single player. Yeah. But it's just not worth it to me. Exactly. So, you, you figure you let them go for a couple of years, and maybe they drop the price, but still... They're like, charging sixty dollars for something they rehash. Yeah, like Black Ops, the original Black Ops. Um, it's came out what, like four years ago, something like that. Still forty bucks. And I, I I can't come to terms with spending forty bucks no. for like a five hour single player campaign. I bought it for twenty pre owned. Mm-hmm. Pre owned. You can get it. You can get like Modern Warfare three crazy cheap though. Now, like on like a PS three, because it that was like the least. When I, back when I worked at GameStop, we had so many copies of that for every console. Mm-hmm. Minus Wii. <laughs> yeah, there, it doesn't count. It doesn't count. Um, all right, so to f- wrap things up, uh, let's just talk about thoughts on the movie. I mean, there's not too much I know about. Oh, was there something you want to talk about Into I the have, Nexus? I have still? one more thought with Into the Nexus uh, regarding the the price and length of the game. It's kind of bittersweet because it definitely works. Um, the amount of time that I sunk into playing it totally cool with the like $30 price tag but it's a little bittersweet because mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to pay another 30 for, for more for more because it's it's so well done but it's just kind of it's short yeah if, it's if, the ending feels very like let like it just kind of happens you don't notice it but all of a sudden it's there mm-hmm. yeah it definitely better than quest for booty which was yeah, <laughs> that, I think that one was like fifteen bucks. Mm. Um, no, yeah, it was a really cheap. It was meant to be a little DLC type of yeah, thing, style. But, thing. Uh, yeah, um, that's that's all. I love it. <laughs> I, I just wish there was more of it. I agree. Um, so yeah, to wrap things up, uh, the movie. Any thoughts on what we've seen in, and the, the movie and the upcoming reboot? We'll kind of combine the two. Right. So I haven't really seen a whole lot of the movie except Neither, right. for the trailer. Right, the original trailer. Which is like okay. Like I, w- 
I don't always judge movies. Like, Frozen had a horrible trailer, and I actually ended up liking Frozen, despite, you know, the internet sensation of Let It Go. Sure. Ruining everything. Um, but, like, based on how the game looks... Looks gorgeous. It already looks the like... The gameplay looks fun. Legitimate Pixar movie. Mm-hmm. Like, level of detail. Um, but still... It's the original game, but, reimagined with these amazing graphics, and it's like it's the enough of the same that the nostalgia thing goes off in my it's head, bubbling up. But it's still new enough that I will I'll if without it, a it doubt might, spend like it looks like it might be a new game, like a brand new Ratchet and Clank game, even though it's a reboot of the old one. It's... Yeah, I mean, I'm telling all my friends I have PS4s, if you haven't played the original Ratchet and Clanks, next year's going to be a great time to start. It's a true, it's true. And the movie that's tying along in with it looks good, too. Though I am interested, like, because they have all the fa- all the voice actors, James Arnold Taylor, um, Jim Ward as Quark, uh, I forget who else they have on there, but all the original voice actors are there. Um... And then on top of that, uh, they're going to the the writer of all the games. He's doing the screenplay, so and they're using the same models from the game for the movie. So it's looking like they're really like Insomniac's going all into this. Mm. Like they're really trying. They're uh, and I can only imagine. Up oh, computer started up. Shh, sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> that's not a thing. Uh, <laughs> doesn't exist. Fix it in post. <laughs> um. Uh. But, like, they're going all into it with all the different voice actors. I mean, all the voice actors, the writers, like, everything. Like, they're just going, they're putting, they're going for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um, It's interesting. I think they're really trying to harness that, like, kid market now. Because I think Ratchet & Clank's been out long enough. And it's taken on some serious tones. That you have the people like us that started playing them when we were, like, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. And the games have kind of matured a little bit with us, and I think they want to take a step back, reboot it, have the tweens, I guess, yeah. of now, you start getting into it. And that's great, because if more people are buying it, that means more games, with, and that can only be good, but... I think it's one of, like, I mean, I know it's not the most, the, the longest running franchise in game history, but it's got to be one of the longest running successful ones. Mm-hmm. Like it's just got to be cuz why else would they be making a movie out of it now? Like it, Into the Nexus had to have sold well otherwise I don't think they would have gone on with the movie. Mm-hmm. Cuz if it didn't sell well then there wouldn't have been any like drive cuz the thing is they to take this risk they have to know their their hardcore fans are going to be in it. If they're what if Into the Nexus died, they would know their hardcore fan base is gone. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it died then. Because otherwise, I mean, I could be wrong in this thinking, but it's got to it's it's got to be like, yeah, it's got to be one of the best selling franchises. I mean, Zelda definitely is probably the top selling if that like longest running top selling because I can't think of anything else. Like, I mean, Halo maybe, but Halo doesn't have as many games. I think Final Fantasy, but that, oh, I mean that there's a lot. Of, I keep forgetting about those. When you get there's a lot of like franchises. Thirteen, thirteen, two, thirteen, three. It's and then there's like... ten and ten two. Then the Final Fantasy Tactics. Right. And then so all it's... the different Final Fantasies that are on. There's even Final Fantasies on the. Oh, you ever heard of the Wonder Swan? I have not. The Wonder Swan was a hand. It was a it was a like a Game Boy, but you know it's like a it's a handheld console that was only released in Japan by Hasbro. I think it's Hasbro. Huh. Yeah, it was a goofy name. It was actually done developed by the same guy who developed the Game Boy, Gunpei Yokoi. If I probably butchered his name, I'm horrible at it. But he helped design it. And when Sony, when uh, Square had all like you know switch over to Sony for the PlayStation, they're like, "Screw you, Nintendo!" and went over to the Wonder Swan for their handheld market. And when the Wonder Swan tanked, which <laughs> okay, it didn't tank. It did decent in Japan, but it never got released in America. Um, and so after that kind of like, not really tanked, but died, they're like, Hey, Nintendo, you know, we kind of miss you. And so that's why you have like, you know, the, the Dawn of Souls type of thing on the Game Boy Advance. You have the Final Fantasy reboots on the Game Boy Advance Mm. DS and the remakes and everything like that. Um, anyway, so Ratchet and Clank, we went off on, I went off on another tangent. Yeah. Um, I had heard from... 
It might have been one of the IGN topics or one of the, like the Game Over Greggy kind of stuff, but they were saying that Sony may be angling for new parents where it's like, I mean, we don't have kids, but we're of the age where it's like, it's possible that we would have kids. Yeah. And so there's definitely people that grew up on the original Ratchet and Clank games that could then be reintroducing their children to this franchise they love. And, I don't know, that's kind of cool. I like that cycle. I do, too. Um, I, I, th- do, I do worry a little bit that it's going to be, like, extra cartoony and even more, like, young humor. If they keep with, um, like, going commando-style humor and even, like, using um, modern references, like or, like, pop culture references, like, in uh, Full Frontal Assault, where they took, like, current stuff from the internet and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, they had the Trollolo song and um, Gangnam Style and what whatnot. Like, that's totally fine. Um, I just gotta, like... I, like you said, I just hope they don't overdo it. I, I They could definitely make it work. Insomniac's really good with... Like, they treat Ratchet and Clank very well, even with their offshoot ones. I mean, their other games... You know, oh, the Resistance they, they did, too. They mm-hmm. don't do Resistance anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm actually... I'm interested to see how this works, because Insomniac has been or had been, a Sony studio for mm-hmm. ages, since PS1 they did was Spyro. Sunset Overdrive, too, didn't they? Right, yeah. So I then really wanted to play that. They were they were with Sony all the way up until the PS... Like, end of the PS3 generation. Uh-huh. They made Fuse, which is multi-platform, and that didn't do great. Um, and was... then they signed on with Microsoft to do an exclusive Sunset Overdrive. Um, which I'm... I'm Pretty sure it got like nice reviews. It got very. People I've like that. noticed, and it, honestly, I think Fuse only died because of EA's hand. That's e- entirely fair. I, I, because you know we saw that when it was called Overwatch, it had a lot more character mm-hmm. in its trailer, but EA, you know, sucks the life out of everything. It's yeah, it's uh, they don't want to take risks. They just want their profits. Yeah. So. And, I mean, like I said, at the same time, can you blame them when AAA games are so expensive to mm-hmm. make? But, like, Fuse just had no character to it. It was so serious when we played it. It was kind of... Yeah, I would... I'd actually love to pick that up in, like, a bargain bin or something and run through that with you if you're interested. Oh, I'd be down. I'd be down. Um, all right. So, I guess before we close in our final thoughts, 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 the last thing I do want to bring, uh, bring, uh, talk about is, uh, that why the hell is Sylvester Stallone a voice actor in the Ratchet and Clank movie? Is he? He is. Do we know what character he's playing? No. Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could do some digging on the internet. I just looked online. I heard it before before I even read it on Wikipedia. I forget. It's on, but like Paul Giamatti is going to be a voice in it. So is Rosario Dawson. I really want to know what Sylvester Stallone's going to play because I can't picture him doing anything video game related. Unless... Other than like his weird '90s movie, not weird, but his '90s movies being turned into Super Nintendo games. Uh-huh. Like I found Cliffhanger on Super Nintendo the other. I didn't buy it, but sure, it's there. Sure. I've tried Demolition Man on Super Nintendo. That's hard as hell. Hey man, that was a good, that was a good. I movie. love that movie. Yeah. Um, but I, but any final thoughts on uh, the upcoming game and the upcoming movie? Uh, I'm excited. Computer, fix it in post. <laughs> Yes, um, I I'm excited as well. Yeah, I mean, I I mean they could be bad, but I seriously doubt that. I think Sony and Insomniac both have a lot on the line here, and they want to make it count. I agree. Um, all right, guys, so that pretty much wraps it up. We've been talking for a good long while about Ratchet and Clank and how much we love it. So if you haven't played these games, definitely check it out. So until next time, guys, see you later. See you.